Okay, uh, welcome everyone to, to Office Hours. Um, we have a very snazzy new, uh, I don't know, slide to remind people to turn their cameras on. Um, it is important that, you know, we get to see faces during the day while many of us uh, aren't getting that opportunity. So it's a big help to us if you can turn cameras on. Um, I actually got this tip from uh, someone at HubSpot who I had a meeting with earlier this week. Jeremy and myself had a meeting uh, with a man named Nick who runs a lot of Zoom uh, Zoom trainings for like internal trainings for HubSpot employees. And you can maybe guess why we were having uh, that call. That's because um, we had a DBT, the DBT Learn, the world tour lined up um, and we're pivoting to a remote version of that. And we wanted to learn uh, from someone who's experienced at giving Zoom trainings like what the best ways that we can deliver that training is so that it's still really useful for people. Um, so I'm really excited that we will be doing those in the next few weeks. Uh, we've announced the first one, but just to people who are already registered for a training course to make sure that they get priority and we'll open them up um, as we go through, as, as we put more on the calendar. Um, yeah, other than that, a lot of posts and announcements recently. DBT turned four. Happy birthday to us. Um, quick joke on that. We saw a job description the other day. There was someone who said they wanted someone with like three years plus of DBT experience. And we were like, okay, you want a founder. Like no one has that. <laughs> cool. Um, that, was, that was cool to see. So DBT turned four, good blog post on that. Uh, we've redone some docs. I might give a sneak peek at the future of docs um, at the end of this, if that's something that's interesting to people. Um, yeah, and what else did we put in there? Oh, and I wrote a playbook as well, which I shared. Um, but we can dive into all those later. Uh, for now, I'm going to stop sharing. Um, Alan, do you have permission to share your screen? You are on mute. Can you hear me now? And can you yeah. see my screen? Excellent. Cool. Well, thanks for inviting me along, guys. Um, hi from hi from the European side of the pond, where everyone's on lockdown. Um, so, welcome to my kitchen. Um, as as Claire said, um, uh, we've been doing kind of semi blue green deployments with DBT for for a while now. Um, and uh, actually, if if DBT is turning four, uh, I think we've been using DBT for almost two years now. So this is. Um, some, I, one of the interesting things we can talk about towards the end of this is how some of the techniques we've been using here have changed um, over the time we've been using DBT. So uh, some of you guys may have seen a, a, a meetup talk from, from one of the analysts at Tails. Um, oh, I didn't introduce Tails. We make dog food on the internet. Uh, if anyone's in Europe and has a dog and wants to feed our food, um, message me. I'll give you a code. Um, so roughly our model structure, and hopefully this probably looks relatively familiar to most people. So we've got a couple of layers in our DVT model structure. Um, if I think about roughly how many models we have, we have kind of, I think about four or 500 models um, in, our, in our overall structure. Um, most of those are in a kind of base layer at the bottom here with, where we're just selecting from one of the raw tables. Then we have a, a, def, a definition layer, which is very similar to kind of what you might call the nouns of, of the business. Uh, so we talk about customers here, we talk about pets, try to join it together as, as few tables as possible, but keep things nice and clean. We then have a, a transform layer, which does any hard calculations that we need to do. Um, and then we get to some of the top layers. We have a core layer, um, which is the, the main models we would expect kind of not very advanced SQL users to be, to be playing around in. We have a rough reporting layer at the top um, to feed any of the more complicated reports we do. Hopefully this looks quite similar to a lot of people's structures. Um, the top layer is visible to most people, so the two yellow bits and the bottom layers are invisible to most people who aren't analysts uh, so that we keep people doing safe stuff. Um, this is useful context. Uh, the, the, for the left, if you look on where we talk about reporting core, transform, def, and base, the code looking font underneath it is the name of the schema. So the way that we expose a lot of this is having lots of uh, views or, or tables in those schemas. Um, we're currently using Snowflake uh, as a database in the background, and this, this is a diagram that might get a little bit more complicated uh, as, as we build it up, but 
broadly, we've got um, if, if people aren't familiar with Snowflake structure, uh, you can have tables of views which sit in schemas, and schemas sit in databases, and databases behave a lot like super schemas. Um, so we have a selection of databases we're using for, for deploying this. Um, we've got the kind of one that most people see. Uh, it's called TailsDB, and it's got a selection of schemas in it that look very similar to the ones before. We've got Analytics Reporting, Analytics Core, Analytics Transform, Def, Base, and there are a couple of others, but those are the important ones. Um, this is readable by most users. It's writable only by one user, and it's continuously available. We've got people querying this um, all the time is the short version, uh, including a lot of our automated um, analytics, I guess, machine learning, any data science we're doing, we'll be doing off feature engineering in, in these schemas. So having times when this isn't available, it makes people annoyed. So the question is then where do we build stuff? Where, do we, where are we doing our refreshes of all of our models? We've got a separate one, uh, a separate database here where we're building the next live version. Uh, that means only one concurrent build process can be in there because the schema names are the same. Um, the schema names are intentionally identical. We'll come back to why that is in a second. Um, and it's hidden to most users, writable only by a prod user. We've got a third database full of, full of other versions of the same schemas here. Um, the ones that you can see in slightly larger text at the top all have prefixes of people's initials. Um, so this is where people's personal version of the tree would be building if they want to test features that aren't that they don't want anyone else to see yet. They want to see what actually comes out of it. And um, we've also got a load in here which are prefixed with uh, git commit hashes. So where we've got automated build pipelines around um, particular git branches, uh, those get built and tested in exactly the same schema. Now here, it's one database where we're effectively sharding the structure by the schema name. Um, and the permissions are a whole lot more lax. So, so far I've not talked anything about the blue-green deployment side of this. And the way that we achieve that deployment is by using this TailsDB and, and the staging DB here. Um, so that once the staging DB has been built completely, we just do an atomic swap of the names between the two. Um, where and we can do that in, in one command in Snowflake and do that with uh, effectively inside a transaction so that um, to anyone who's querying the database as we go, they, they just see things swap over nicely. And everything is rosy and that works perfectly most of the time, except that's also not the case at the moment. Um, so this is, this is the point where it's potentially interesting to look back at, at where we used to be. So we used to do uh, we used to do this a, a similar process to this on Redshift. Um, we used to be we used to use Redshift and, and switched over to to Snowflake, um, and ended up seeing some weird things happen when we did this. So we because Redshift doesn't really have the uh, well, it does have the concept of databases, but not in the same concept, not in the same way as Snowflake. What we were doing was doing atomic schema swaps. So we would have a selection. Uh, I think. You saw before that the schemas were called analytics uh, reporting, analytics base, et cetera, et cetera. There would be also kind of staging reporting, staging base, staging transform. Um, and what we didn't appreciate at the time was that on Redshift, these the views reference objects, and they get linked to those objects at the definition point of those, um, of those views. So that means when we do atomic schema swaps, they're clean, that their things still refer to the same objects. Um, and happy, happy days. What we've recently found out with Snowflake is that um, views reference names rather than refer referencing objects. And those are also the qualified names and they only get worked out at, um, at query time. So that means if, for example, in our uh, top level core model, um, we have uh, a view which references, I don't know, uh, well, it will be, it'll be built in the staging database. So it would be staging database, base schema, base model. Once that view gets switched over onto, it happens in the atomic swap, the view is still referencing that staging database. Um, and so we, we get effectively dirty blue-green deploys. Now, uh, at the moment, because we're deploying relatively regularly and most of the changes that happen on each deploy are small, um, we, nobody notices that this is happening. And I guess every, you only end up with models being one deploy behind. Um, what that, 
but but effectively the swaps aren't atomic and if we go around and start trying to clear up that staging schema and delete everything out there sometimes models um the references don't work now one way of mitigating this is, is using materialized views so if, if we've materialized it in that staging database before we do the atomic swap then it works um but if we haven't materialized it then some things happen that are a little bit strange and i think um uh, some people might have seen um, uh, a PR that I uh, put in for, for DBT for the next major release, which should hopefully deal with this, um, so that we put in uh, less fully qualified names when, when using Snowflake here. So if uh, the default rendering of names at the moment has uh, the database name, the schema name, and the model name, um, and so therefore when we switch over it, it gets lost. And what I'd like to be able to do in the future is to have just the schema name and the model name in there so that when we do the atomic swap, that it stays within its own database. And that's what we do at the moment. Um, uh, it, it means we can achieve effectively uh, trans uh, invisible uh, live deploys of new data out into, um, out into the, our organization without anyone noticing any swap over between the, the previous one and the new one, uh, while still being able to build a complete fresh version of our models separately test it and if the, you know, all of the good stuff you'd expect to be doing and, and not deploy it if any of that fails. That's basically it. Anyone got any, Anyone got any questions? Yeah. So many questions. <laughs> um, very, very quick question, hopefully. Uh, does Amazon support a swap parameter? This is news to me. In Redshift? Yeah, Amazon Redshift. I so I can't remember if there is a swap parameter on the on the rename but, yeah. or what I think we might have actually done. So I think Redshift supports transactions quite nicely, yes. um, and I think you can do a. Uh, I think we effectively did a three-way name swap where yeah. we un and name it one way and name the other one in and yeah. then the other one in after that. I think yeah. that's what we did, but did it within a transaction to make sure that um, it looks the same. Cool, um, and I have. I have a few more, I'm gonna ask one more question and then I'll, I'll let the people in the chat chime in. Um, uh, no, I may have already forgotten this question. Oh yeah, is this to mainly mitigate when you have errors, like test pr test errors in production builds? Like you're doing a DBT run, a DBT test step and the test step fails to like get around that sort of bad data maybe persistent. Um, what, what it gets, so we've got a mixture of, of materialized um, uh, models and uh, models that are views. And what we were finding, and I realized this might be very old information. So th if this isn't the case anymore, then, uh, then, then someone could point it out. Um, when doing a refresh, we were finding that the, the models further down the tree were being removed in order that uh, we could recreate them. And in removing them, they would remove the models further up the tree. And so at some point in the build process, some of the models would be unavailable because they've been removed because they were about to be replaced. Um, and this is a way of ensuring that at any point in the deployment process, every, every model is still available to be queried, uh, even if it has dependencies that are being built. Um, Drew, do you want to chime in whether that's still an issue? Yeah, we fixed that issue. It was with full refreshing incremental models, right? Where there was there's downtime for the duration of the build that right yes so we if if for example we had um a view i'm trying to know this is this is old in our deployment cycle but if this is if this is fixed then great um it it, uh, it was meaning that during a refresh of anything uh non is that still also true if there's a schema change so if if we're not doing an incremental build we do a full refresh I don't know that I uh, fully understand the the circumstances you're describing. With that. I, well, I, I may, I, maybe we should just try it. Um, I guess this we put this this structure in place um, probably a year ago, um, because we were having issues with with models dropping out. Um, but if that's not the case anymore, that'd be awesome. I th I think this is still like totally valid uh, in the world in which like which is the current world that where the test step doesn't stop bad data. From mm. like, like if you do DBT run and then DBT test and something's gone wrong in a production run, that those results could still, still persist. So I think this is like 
really interesting for, for, for that use case as well. Um, there's a few questions on the chat. Um, mm. Alan, do you just want to like, call, like pick on Get someone them. and then that person can introduce themselves and ask their question? Sure. Um, I'll go through them in roughly the order it looks like they were posted in. Uh, so I think we've fairly got, we've got from uh, Amelia. Emily. But Emily. Hey, uh, so I'm curious how many times a day, I'll just lump my two questions together because they're related. How many times a day are you doing this? We do um, it every hour. Every hour. And are yeah. you ever doing it for like, when you run DBT run, do you always run everything or are you running parts of your DBT graph? Like, uh, plus certain models and only doing some of them. At the moment, we do it for everything. Um, and that's just about still working. Um, I think it's starting to creak at the seams. Um, I think uh, when we were refreshing every hour and the build process was 20 minutes, then that was nice. Um, and it included full refreshes of some of the materialized models. Uh, it's starting to creak a bit and we're, the, the build time is approaching an hour, which means that the hourly deploys are going to start breaking. Um, I'd love to start doing the subsections of our DBT graph and, and um, building just them. I think there's going to be some thought process that needs to go into which bits. Um, and I'm not sure our, our graph has been designed well with that in mind at the moment. Uh, was, it, was that was that there was that the second question as well? Uh, no, that was the second question. Yeah, yeah. Thanks for the answer. That that's super interesting. Um, the best DBT talk that I think of a lot around running only part of your graphs came out of Betterment. So if that's floating mm. around on the internet from a previous DBT meetup, like that one may be good to watch as you think about this problem because I nice. think they ran every fifteen minutes. So thanks for the question. It looks like Jonathan Talmy has the next one. Yeah, Jonathan. Hey, thanks for the presentation. I'm just wondering what criteria your staging schema has to satisfy before you swap it into production. Um, all of the all of the criteria it has to fulfill. Uh, we use use the DBT test um, functionality. Um, I guess there's a small section of um, column checks, so uniqueness, no nulls, um, but we're quite sparing in exactly which ones those are. Um, there's probably three or four, I guess, total checks where we're, so for example, we'll add up the number of orders we shipped last year and compare it to uh, a known CSV, um, which has been populated using a seed. And the, the last criteria that it has to fulfill, and I realize this one is, is less interesting for the staging environment, but we, these are the same tests that would get applied to any of the test builds we're doing, um, is checking model dependency. Um, those, that graph I showed right at the top of the presentation about making sure that um, we have transform models that only depend on def models and base models, and making sure we don't have dependencies that go up rather than down. Um, there's a plugin that I put together for, for Snowflake to, to introspect some of those, which we, which we use there. Now it's, that's getting a little bit, there's, there's areas where that doesn't work. Um, in particular, um, we're starting to use, um, data sharing on Snowflake with a couple of our suppliers and a lot of the data sharing gets exposed as secure views and secure views don't let you, um, see where their dependencies are, but rather than failing nicely, the Snowflake command that um, allows you to see which views a view depends on, uh, it just errors rather than giving you a nice, uh, a nice like a null, null response or something like that. Um, so those are, the, those are kind of the three families of checks we do. Okay, thanks. Uh, the next question looks like it's from David. Hi, um, I was just wondering about how you swapped. So you've got your staging schema and then you've got your production schema. I assume that your staging schema is running um, and, you know, some incremental models, but, and maybe some full refreshes as well. But, um, and then once it's finished and I'm, you're going to run some kind of, clone, like a using Snowflake's cloning feature to clone that into the, 
production schema? The, the short answer is no. Um, I think that where we've been with this model of deployment um, has made it tricky to do incremental models to start with. And I think we, we're accepting that we're going to need to get back to incremental models. Um, we used to have some, we got rid of them because they didn't really work with this, with this deployment method. Um, but the, the time it's taking to refresh some of the bigger ones means that we're going to have to bring it back again. Um, we haven't used the, um, the cloning stuff. And also, I think the, the run operations, I think, could be interesting. It's, I've actually not had a poke around with it since it, since it was released. So um, uh, I might definitely have a look at that later. OK. Uh, next question was from uh, Nihil. Uh, yeah, yeah. Nihil. Hey, yeah. I am. Um, hey. So yeah, just wanted to chime in um, on Claire's question on where this is useful. Um, I totally agree. One of the places is where if you run dbt run and run dbt test, test might break, but your data is already after dbt run in your production. So this is a good way to kind of first test before. So like the right audit uh, publish setup. Um, but another useful thing that I was thinking of and very timely, like recently we had this problem where someone was running a full refresh on an incremental model, which took four or five hours. But when you run that on prod um, in like a singular job, one off ad hoc job, what happened is there's downtime on that reporting and everything downstream is also kind of blocked. So I was thinking if we can do that in this kind of environment where we do blue green deploys to mask full refreshes, which take a long time and then swap when it's ready. Mm -hmm. um, those are required when you're doing schema changes or stuff like that, um, or you're completely changing the business logic. So, but Drew was mentioning that I, I didn't understand fully when Drew said that there is something that you guys released which has solved that problem. Or or was it not related? Uh, I don't know if it's related. Okay. What's uh, wait? I'm, I'm. What's the what's the question? Maybe. So I'm so th this was the question is. Um, I mean, this is not a question. This I was just chiming in that mm. this is another place it'll be useful. Um, and then oh, definitely. Um, the real question is that uh, how do you prevent writing from your current prod while you're building new staging? You mean people, you mean other users writing into the same schemas or you mean yeah. write, writes to the underlying writing data? But I guess you're not doing incremental, so it doesn't matter because it's just views. No, we, that's we, how you we, circumvent the problem. We just, um, we just make sure none of the other users have write permissions to it. Um, and uh, and make sure uh, a, a little bit of diligence about which usernames get used where. That's all. Uh, nothing particularly okay. uh, yeah. rocket science. -y. Because uh, multiple jobs are writing to our production using incremental models. So when I start kicking off this thing to build in staging, mm -hmm. there might still be writes happening there. So I might need to clone or I might need to do something more. I think, uh, yeah, I think I see what you mean. Um, yeah, because at the moment we own uh, all of our deployment to the prod thing is single threaded. There's only one thing accessing it at once. Um, so I, I could see a world if we had a much more complicated setup where we were doing blue green deploys for schema changes and a more regular cycle for incremental changes that we'd need to coordinate and make sure that there wasn't a schema change deploy going on at the same time as a, an incremental deploy at the same time. Um, if, if I was having that problem, I would be a very happy person because I think our deployment would be in a much better place. Um, looks like the next question is from Pedro. Oh, and I think I wonder if that's actually the same question we had before about. Yeah, I mean, uh, I, I, I had noticed the question before, kind of similar, but what I'm wondering is like, is that view issue that you talked about, if you clone the database, is in the clone, is the, the view pointing to the old database or is it pointing to that same database? Hmm. I've never really explored the, the idea of using cloning um, to. Yes. Yeah, I, to I do it. Expect the clone to point to the to the same standalone database, right? Uh, that way, you know, you could even drop the old database. So I'm wondering if there's a way to do like an atomic uh, clone, kind of like imagine like start a transaction, clone, replacing the production schema, let's say, or maybe mm. rename, and then kind of swap it, but using cloning instead of the atomic swap. I, I've never, I've not played much around with cloning. Do you know how how long a clone operation takes? Is it is it effectively instantaneous, or does it is there quite a long delay around it? 
It depends on how on on you know how much data you have really. Um, I've, I've seen them take a few seconds if it's not too much, and they could take uh, you know maybe a few minutes depending on how much how many tables and, and data you have. Yeah, no, that sounds that sounds like a pretty good direction for us to. I think that the question of how do we get back to incremental models has been um, has been one that's floating around for a while. So. Um, I think cloning seems like a good a good place to start with that. Okay. Cool. That's it on the questions on uh, on the chat. Um, Claire, where do we go from here? I, I have one more question. Yeah. Uh, are you how are you currently? I think this might have been covered, but I might have been busy drinking tea. Um, how are you? <laughs> uh, how are you actually doing this in 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 code? Like, what's the code that you're writing? Is it an on run end hook? Is it a is it a, ah, a Python script that gets invoked? Uh, it's, I, I, I suspect it's extremely gross. Um, it's a Python script, um, yeah. which is calling uh, dbt commands using uh, shell scripting. It, it, effectively, it's calling a subprocess and within that calling dbt as though it's any other any other command. Um, I think this is, I, I don't know if, it, if importing dbt commands and running from other scripts is already out. I know last time I checked as to whether it was available, it was a, it, there was a discussion going on around it. Um, but uh, and so we did something that's that's kind of gross. It's the kind of the deployment script for this is the kind of code that you don't really want anyone else to look at because it feels <laughs> like it's like your kind of dirty laundry. Um, okay, there's not a slide on that part. <laughs> oh yeah, 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 yeah. definitely. I mean, I think, um, like Drew said in the chat, like definitely run operations are, are a great thing yeah. here. So I think they came out in like 14. Drew, do you want to speak about how, how you might solve it with operations? Um, yeah, Claire, I sure can. Um, you know, run operations are just a way of invoking a macro from the command line, basically like a regular dbt run or test invocation. Mm. And the macros can run queries against the database using a statement or this run query function. Um, and so, the way that we use them is a little different than the way that you might be able to use them. But in our um, CI builds kicked off when new pull requests are open, we do a clone of our production uh, database into a staging database or like a more CI build database. We run you know, dbt run, dbt test there, make sure everything passes. Um, the benefit is that we have a very large events table that would take a very long time to build from scratch and it's incremental. And so working off of a clone, which is, I think, a metadata operation. So even for big tables is, is very, very quick. Um, no data is actually moved in the process. Um, we use the run operation to kick off like a, a, a clone query, basically, to, to nice. do a dbt build on top of. And I, I think we actually pinched that idea from GitLab, potentially. Maybe. Um, I looked through the GitLab CI code uh, to see what was going on with their dbt builds. And I got, I got some questions for some people. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> we'll say, say that to the end maybe um yeah cool so i think like snowflake i think we have a pretty good solution for this redshift like you can't do it you can use transactions to do the sort of like that moves there that moves there and that moves there and if, if anything goes wrong roll it back um big query i don't know if there's any big query users on on the call but uh i actually like was in LA in, in another time where we were able to leave our home and, and get on planes. Um, I was in LA a few weeks ago and I uh, chatted with someone from Quibi. I don't know if anyone's seen their ads in the US. Um, they had a Super Bowl ad and they're doing blue green deploys with BigQuery. But my understanding is that that must just be extremely expensive because on BigQuery, you can't actually rename anything. Like you would just have to do a blue run and then redo a green run. I don't know, Jeremy, do you want to like reverse engineer how you think they might be doing that? Is Jeremy on here? Maybe not. Drew, do you have any thoughts? Um, yeah, I'm going to go find Jeremy. He lives on the street <laughs> for me. Uh, just kidding. I, in BigQuery, you can clone a table for free, and it's very fast. Um, it's different than, you know, create table as select star from other table. It's, it's more of like a back-end BigQuery operation. But... Uh, it's probably a, a non-trivial script that they might have running mm. to copy all the tables and port over all the views too. That sounds pretty complicated. Yeah, because they were talking, they were like, we've got a direct line into BigQuery developers who are trying to like 
get a rename statement. So for those of you who haven't used BigQuery, there's like literally no like rename table statement, rename anything. And it's like not, <laughs> yeah, Drew, Drew was just, uh, yeah. So hopefully that's a real thing coming soon. You can do crazy things on BigQuery. You can run machine learning models, but you can't rename a table, <laughs> which is wild. Um, but I'm, I'm wearing my snowflake hoodie today. So I'm, uh, I'm on team snowflake nice. today. Yeah. Um, cool. Yeah. Thank you so much, Alan. Thank you so much for everyone, uh, like contributing to that discussion. I think it's really cool to see like how some of these more mature deployments, uh, look in, you know, some of, some of the businesses that have 500 models. Uh, that's, that's pretty crazy. This is what DBT legacy looks like. <laughs> um, my other, like one thing that I was thinking about was like, Drew, do you think there are any things on the product front that we could do that are in the pipeline that could like, make this an even better workflow in the future? Um, I sure do. And I, I want to applaud all the people applauding Alan <laughs> in the Zoom chat. Yeah. Good work, everyone. Uh, thanks thanks guys. For sharing. Um, yeah, you know, Alan, I think we went back and forth on a, hmm. maybe a couple of different issues trying to figure out how to do this in the first place. And mm. um, the really thing that makes this tough for DBT to do natively is that every database, every database has their own sorts of semantics about, yeah. um, like you're talking about Redshift does things differently than Snowflake and tables and views are different and things like that. So um, I would like to make DBT do something like optimally sensible. Um, right now it interpolates like database.schema.table always, but it could very well, um, be smarter in a database aware way of how it mm. references other tables such that you wouldn't have to think that hard about this in the first place. Um, for It's always funny having these conversations because it spans like a very large topic area that like most people, maybe some people have a lot of experience on Redshift and Snowflake, but like the Redshift, Snowflake, BigQuery trifecta. If you're not a DBT maintainer and you have deep knowledge about all of those things, like you, you might've had a bad experience at work for the past yeah. two years or something. Um, so anyway, it's just to say on, big, on Redshift, if you use late bound views, you must qualify a table with the schema name. Uh, so the type of approach we'd want to use on Snowflake would in fact yeah. be invalid in certain circumstances on Redshift. So um, yeah, I, I think that we came to a really good place where you can in fact just override the ref statement and implement yeah. your own logic. And that's like ultimate flexibility. And I would like to play around with that include policy, um, mm. maybe with different database specific um, defaults that you could override if you need to. I think yeah. that could be a good idea. Yeah. Cool. Um, yeah. Thank you so much, Alan. Um, that was amazing. Uh, really cool office house. Um, I mean, and it's not over yet. I don't know. Uh, I, uh, I thought that I might chat a little bit about marketing attribution because that's the thing that I've been I wrote a lot about recently. I'm less prepared than Alan, so this would be great. Um, but if you want to hear less from me, which is probably true, um, the best thing you can do is hit me up with a topic idea. Maybe it's something in your project that you think is really cool. Maybe you need like, you want feedback on something. You're like, hey, I'm trying to do this thing. Here's the code that I've written. Like, how are others solving this problem? Um, yeah, we, we are looking for topics. For, for these office hours because I think like Alan's topic was a perfect one where it's like here's how Taylor's is doing a thing and we could sort of uh, we could all we all learn something I think and also um, we're able to like think about how we could apply it to our own projects too so that's really cool so if you want to hear less of me uh, send me topics that would be amazing um, okay marketing attribution um, I'm also uh, joined by Aaron uh, Aaron Vaughan um, I was about to say Aaron Ogilvy for Aaron Vaughan. Um, Aaron, do you want to introduce yourself? Hi everyone, uh, Aaron Vaughan here from the Fishtown Squad. I run our customer success team. Yeah, so um, Aaron uh, is so, uh, former title is Director of Consulting, now it's Director of Customer Success, which is an, an even bigger team, which is super exciting. Um, and the reason I wanted Aaron on this call is because I recently wrote um, this marketing attribution playbook, but the truth of it is, uh, was that I wrote it, but it's actually a lot of Aaron's. Aaron and Tristan's work, uh, and I was just, just the mouthpiece. So not subscription revenue, 
Uh, wrong one, that was one we did a while back. Uh, marketing attribution. Um, so this is a playbook. Um, playbooks are this sort of new type of content that uh, we're working with. We did one as I just accidentally showed about subscription revenue and now on attribution. Um, and the reason we're doing these is because at this point we've worked with hundreds of companies, Erin, is that right? Yep, um, hundreds of companies and some of the work we do, we've done dozens and dozens of times. Um, and it's very similar across different companies. And so we're basically trying to outsource, so open source um, the work that we've, we've done uh, for clients so that everyone can do it because we care more about like more people doing analytics really, really well, rather than this being some like secret that, that, uh, that we're keeping. So um, this is a very long playbook. Uh, I kind of was like, marketing attribution is super simple. Uh, I don't know why, you know why people think it's so hard and then I continued to write like 4,000 words on it. So um, one of those interesting ones. So if you haven't seen one of these playbooks before, um, we sort of always start off with a like, what is the thing that, that we're trying to build? Um, and then, wait, where is it? Sorry, I'm flipping through this too quickly. Uh, one of the crazy things is that we actually write an entire DBT project. So if you're someone who just wants to see code, you can just go to the code. And this is like, this code here is like the secret source of everything. Um, so I think marketing attribution is a thing that most companies have to deal with. Um, I'll run through the basics for those who haven't read the article. Uh, this article runs through like, if you're an e-commerce company, you're trying to get to, you're trying to get this like table that represents every single time someone's visited your website in the form of a session. Um, and also a timestamp uh, that, you know, is represents that their conversion timestamp. So maybe it's when they made a first order, if you're selling flying mattresses to someone. Um, and then you just need to find all the sessions that happened before they actually converted for each customer, use a window function for total sessions and session index, and then calculate points. So there's like first touch, last touch, linear, uh, and 40, 20, 40. Um, these are like, this is called positional attribution. Um, a lot of people like want to talk about like Markov chains, things like that, but we really think like just getting the basics down pat is the hardest part. And like, if you get to this point, you're actually doing really, really well. Of like just calculating points. Um, if you have revenue, multiply revenue out because then you can actually look at like the value of your attribution channels. Um, and if you have ad spend, which we do in here, oh, and this is 0 0.16.0, so my analyses, analysis got shown in this documentation. Um, if you have ad spend and if you have really clean UTM parameters, which every single business has really, really clean UTM parameters, um, it's a really simple query of like grouping things up by like grouping your spend up by different UTM, like say UTM source, grouping your attribution up by UTM source as well, and then joining them to each other so that at the end of the day, you get a table that looks like, do, 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 no, too far, uh, like this, you know, on the 1st of Feb, which is when I started working on this. Uh, I actually started working this way before then. Uh, I spent you know, $47 on AdWords and I had 1.37 conversions. So my cost per acquisition was $34.33. Like, that's pretty cool. That's uh, my return on ad spend when I include the customer value is like 41 cents. So not a super high performing channel, but higher performing than um, Facebook ads. I'm, I'm a D2C business that's losing money, which is uh, maybe too close to the truth. <laughs> Um, but yeah, like I'm not going to run through the entire playbook in this conversation. I just kind of more wanted to you to, ha um, set aside some time in case anyone had some questions about attribution, uh, some things they wanted to, to challenge, uh, that it, that it's in this article or anything like that. Is there no one, no one in the chat? 
Um, I'll kick off some conversation yeah. around this. Why not? Um, so the playbook does a really good job of talking about first acquisition, um, which I think is the best place to start. Um, we've had so many clients along the way who uh, we implement this for, and then they make comments like, well, such a high percentage of our ad spend is towards retargeting. Um, and so this does not help you do that. Um, and so another thing that we often see customers do is actually take not just the first order um, and join that into sessions, but actually all orders and join them into sessions such that the um, most recent purchase uh, is included in that join that Claire showed. So basically if I purchase two times and I have five sessions before my first purchase and then two sessions before my next purchase, you're getting attribution points for each of those sessions towards the purchases that actually result from them. Um, and it's just like one step further to go into this process so that you can actually see not just acquisition of customers, but also, um, you know, retargeting purchases. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, that's a huge one. I think like we have a rule of thumb that if you're spending like like 30% or more of your marketing on retargeting, then it's it's probably worth looking at attribution for each purchase as opposed to like customer attribution. Yeah. So that's a pretty good pretty good rule of thumb. Um maybe it's just uh uh Alan, do you want to ask your question out loud? Sure. Um, what kind of response have you heard from non datary people about the playbooks um, and sharing it with them? Yeah. Um, most of my responses have been from data people because that's who's mostly in my network. But I think the, the like related response is like a lot of some of the playbooks we actually are tell, like summarizing a thing that someone's already doing. Like we wrote the subscription revenue playbook and people were like, this puts into words exactly the thing that I've already written in code. Maybe our code looks a little bit different. Um, and so they've been able to use it internally to explain concepts to other people, um, like other people on their team. Like we're doing, mar my ho hope is that someone says like, you know, we're doing marketing attribution. Like when their marketing manager says we want to do attribution and you're like, okay, well, this is the approach we're going to take and you can send them this article. Um, but yeah, if anyone has used a playbook, uh, has shared it with someone who's like not on the data team and, and gotten feedback about whether they're helpful or not. Um, the first part is definitely more written for like kind of SEO, but also for like non data people. Um, so yeah, we're hoping that it like different parts are valuable to different people that are involved in, in data. Um, yeah. We are hoping to maybe do another one of these soon. Um, so if there's any like common analyses that, uh, that someone wants to write up on, um, let us know. We also have a, a list that we're sort of keeping in the backlog. Um, Rob? Hi. Um, so my question was, we've been doing something very similar. So it's really cool to see. Um, I saw that you did the window function for the table mm -hmm. of you. Mm -hmm. um, we've been having, I guess, some problems with running the window function when we're running an incremental. Mm -hmm. um, is there any kind of best practice or any workarounds you can do? So, because we yeah. our touch points are huge. Let me show you. Cool. Um, I don't know, Aaron. Do you have any of this? Any of these in? Uh, like Erin, if you want to have a look on your computer, if you've got any models that do this incrementally that we can share, I'm not sure. But the closest thing that I can show you is um, the segment package has to deal with window functions when it's calculating the session, like the overall session number for a customer. And that's a pattern that you can actually use uh, in like calculating the attribution sessions as well, because it's like the same window functions. Um, I don't know which one it's going to be in. Let's have a look. I'll send this link through. Um, nope. Does anyone know what I'm, where I'm actually looking? Yeah, this was the example yeah. I was going to say to show this right here. Yeah. So um, this logic actually says if this is an incremental run, 
rather than redoing the entire window function, redo the window function for like the latest records and for the session number, like add it to the old session number. So if like me, customer ID one has six sessions and then you do an, an incremental run and I have a new session because it's an incremental run, find the like max session number that I'm up to and then say, well, six plus one in this run means I'm up to seven. Um, it's kind of like hard to say in words, but yeah, here's the code. I'll drop this in the chat uh, very quickly. Um, and yeah, that's how I recommend doing it. Um, I think we might do something slightly different on in the Snowflower package, but I'm more familiar with the Sigma package. So I don't know if anyone wants to chime in on incremental window functions. I don't know. Um, cool. Um, and David, do you have a question as well? Hi. Um, yeah, I, I work with Rob. So ah. um, one of the things we're looking at doing is um, we, we've started with these touch points as well, but we have costs for each touch point. And then we also have LTV um, at a customer level. So we were hoping to understand for each permutation of touch points that occurs for customers, uh, you know, how much L how much LTV each type of touch point has driven and we have costs and therefore we can get ROI. But doing that in SQL could be a bit complicated, especially when you're creating those permutations. I was just wondering if you had any tips for that. Um, Drew, I think you might have done the closest thing to this if I have my library of consulting projects correct for the company based in London that you visited. That's funny. Uh, hey, David, good to see you again. Um, yeah, hey. I uh, I must apologize. I didn't catch the uh, either the first or the um, second half of what you said. So I'll summarize very quickly. Is like how do you do this when you're looking at permutations and combinations of of attribution pathways and oh. like trying to yeah. do like yeah sure. Um, Claire was right to uh, identify that reaching from Markov based attribution models first is a mistake. Uh, but in the past we have. I've worked with tools like Convertro that do the, you know, very data science-y opaque version of this. I've also rolled a Markov based attribution model. Um, the, uh, the cool thing is you kind of build the simulation of like the different pathways, touch points people have throughout your application. And you kind of like simulate over that. Um, and then you can do some either advanced matrix calculations or like, uh, otherwise graph analyses to figure out what the value of any one of those touch points is um, sort of in, in the. I mean, we want to start off simple and just kind of uniformly say, oh, it, it, everything in this permutation was worth the same. Yeah, I mean, the, it's interesting. Once you start considering the ordering of things, the, the types of like high level aggregates outlined in the attribution playbook, like no longer totally work. You have to, um, really what you can do is build the chains yourself based on the order of the touch points and then aggregate over those like ordered like okay. flows, you know, and it obviously you're going to have like a lot of a long tail of weird flows that nobody goes through. Like they got 17 emails and then <laughs> uh, direct or something like you yeah. can throw those away. But for the, the, you know, less than 10 most common pathways of touch points, I would just aggregate the whole chain and look at it um, in its entirety because they probably represent um, common paths that people take. How would you do that aggregation? Would that be like an array aggregation and then group by the array? I, I mean, that's probably like the simplest way to do it. Yeah. Array ag um, within, within group order by, you know, touch point and, um, and just rank those, those um, chains of like, you know, say the first five touch points or something like that. Yeah. I think mm -hmm. like well, one really important thing is to do the simple version first and create a benchmark of like, what does the simple version say? Cause we've seen a ton of people like sink a lot of time into going, well, like of course positional attribution and like dividing points linearly doesn't represent human behavior. And we should do some like more advanced modeling on top of this. And they sink a lot of time into it and they end up at an answer that's like 
roughly the same, but like roughly as useful. So definitely like take the simple version first where you're just doing the like linear points, yeah, that's the first start touch, last touch, first. and like create a benchmark. And like Aaron made a really good point about like whether the model's being used. Do you want to speak to that point, Aaron? Yeah, so this is something that so many uh, of our consulting clients have reached out to us for specifically. And so many of them just say like, I want multi-touch attribution. And then we provide them the type of output that Claire showed in, in the model, and then they don't do anything with it. Um, and I think, I think a piece of this is like, if people are used to a certain type of attribution, though the data team might really want this and the marketing team is asking for it, it's oftentimes very hard to convince the marketing team to change from whatever they've used time and time again, whether that's first touch or last touch typically. Um, and so providing this like very granular view into attribution um, is, is both a blessing and a curse, I think, for many teams to figure out how to then utilize that for the team that's actually going to like use it to change the way that they're, you know. So we're, we're looking to we're looking to offer this to a new team, which is kind of like a sub startup in list, um, who don't have a marketing team to help them at the moment. And so Great, the, the there you main, go. So not yeah. even a problem. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> yeah. Anything you do will be better than nothing. So yeah. yeah. Um, I'm, I'm, gonna, uh, I'm going to read your question out. Um, how do you pick the weightings or even just the model when to some extent people's choice of model will be influenced by the answer they want to come out at the end? So as in whether we choose first touch, last touch, linear. Um, that is that is really good question. Um, one of our pieces of advice in there is like offer all of them at the start and then decide and like hide the rest of the columns or like delete the rest of the columns so that like, every answer is going to be wrong. You just want everyone to have the same wrong answer. <laughs> like... That's, that's kind of important. Um, we, I think typically we see teams going for like uh, 40, 20, 40, if, I, if I'm remembering correctly. Erin, do you want to weigh in on like which, and like it's often driven by the marketing team, like that, that they make the choice. Yeah, I, I, the most recent project that I did attribution for the marketing team, each uh, kind of sub team within marketing was using a different attribution version to prove whatever point they were trying to prove for whichever strategy they were trying to push forward. Um, and so we provided the analyst team all four options. So 40, 20, 40, first, last, and linear. And then they compared to the versions internally that they were working with made the decision to move forward with 40 20 40 and then never even gave the marketing team the option of the other three um, simply because it's kind of like overwhelming to have so many different views into the same type of thing yeah and like marketers are, are good at marketing they're internally as well so they're going to choose whichever one uh if given the choice they're going to choose the one that proves the most their most value <laughs> i, don't I know, think the only other thing that we have yeah, I think the only other thing that we haven't said about this is um, when you start to filter out uh, certain events um, based on if you're only looking for like paid uh, touches or not. Um, so we've worked with teams who are interested in, um, you know, removing direct or um, those types of views so that they're not kind of pulling down any of these modeling simply because you know it's possible that someone visits the site many times depending on the you know marketing strategy and business um, and so it's possible that in a 40 20 40 model you have a lot of middle touches that are paid and then the last version is you know email and so it's getting marked as like a, a free event um, so just something to consider in here as well yeah and then we can start talking about tv spikes as well if we really want to go down that route <laughs> Someone was like, ooh, TV. Um, yeah. Cool. Um, we have five minutes or four minutes left. I might stick around for a little bit in case anyone just wants to like ask any questions um, about anything. But there is one last thing that I just want to like, um, as I like to say, hoet, hoet at appetite for, which is um, we recently uh, redirected our docs to a new version. And it seems like maybe it was a lot of work to do. It was a bit of work to do. Thank you, Drew, for like porting all these docs over. Um, and I just want to share like a little teaser of where we're going with this. And I mean, if you know how to check out a public repo and follow some readme instructions, this is not like, this is all in public. You just have to, to find it. Um, 
in the past, I think we've done a really good job of writing documentation that is very like, oh, you know nothing about seeds. Now you're going to be an expert on seeds. Um, and what we're seeing in the community is that like there's different types of personas who are using our documentation. There's people who are like, I don't know what a seed is. I just want to understand a seed. There's people who know what seeds are, but forget like, oh, what's that parameter that I need to set? Like, what's that configuration? So they kind of more want like a reference section. Um, and we also just have a ton of questions on Slack and we need to come up with a more scalable way to like answer those questions and to make those questions searchable as well. Um, so this is like the rewrite of the seeds documentation that uh, I've been working on and hopefully we're going to do this for other sections too. Um, so seeds before was like zero to 100 all in one page. And now it's like zero to 20 ish, like cool seeds, a CSV files in your DBT project. Here's an example. Here's the related docs, including, I'm so excited. This is localhost 3000. Every single configuration that you can apply to seeds. If anyone's used the looker docs, we're kind of going for something more like that. And then you're like, well, what does quote columns mean? Definition, usage examples, the change log in line, rather than maintaining separate versions of documentation, we're just gonna have a like inline change log um, and recommendations as well. Um, and the thing that I'm really excited about are these FAQs. Um, if anyone saw the tutorial that we like released a couple months ago, I think now, uh, we put in this concept of FAQs, which is like, okay, you're here and now you probably have other questions. And before we used to like list the whole, like every single question out and it could become overwhelming. Whereas now they're these like fun little expandable things, things that we see all the time. Can I use seeds to load raw data? The original version just said no, but um, it's, it's a little bit different now. Uh, how do I test and document seeds? Like all those questions that we get on Slack where like the reason people are asking that question is because our documentation isn't doing a good enough job of like, you know, answering these really easy questions. Um, so yeah, that's, uh, that's my, that's what I'm working on at the moment. It's a, it's a good project given like my current work environment. So hopefully you'll see some progress on this front um, and hopefully not too many broken links, but there might've already been a few, um, but yeah. Cool. Um, that's, that's time. Uh, school's out. You can, you can all head home, uh, or head to your living room. I don't know. Everyone's already home. Um, but I'm also going to stick around if anyone wants to, to chat about anything. Thank you, Claire. But if not, um, stay safe for everyone. Uh, enjoy your afternoons, evenings, nights, wherever you are. Cool. Thanks, Claire. Bye-bye. Thanks. See ya. Thanks, Claire. Bye, Drew. That's it. Alan, I'm assuming you're actually gone, so I'm going to leave. <laughs>